Hi, everybody. Welcome to Habitat Now. I once again have the honor of being your host as we Zoom continued through 2021, almost to 2022. I have the honor today of inviting artist Susan Taylor Glasgow to join us uh, for to share her life experiences and her work. And we have an exciting announcement launching her Cinderella's Handbag Habitat Limited, which will be available after the sh this talk via email, you can always call me, but we're gonna put them up on our website for purchase as well. I've taken over your screen and going to jump through a little bit of housekeeping here. Again, thank you for joining me, taking time out of your day because we are grateful. So many of you saw this little uh, trailer for her Susan, Susan and we're grateful to have her. We have placed the dates for the next in-person live event and we expect you to be there. Um, it's in Florida. We're doing the Glass Coast Weekend once again, partnering with the Imagine Museum. It's going to be January 27th through 29th uh, of next year. So pencil it in, and we hope to see you then. We're going to have lots of, uh, it's a great time to get together and see each other, experience some glass, partner, and see the Fire and Light exhibition, visit the Bash Gallery in the Ringling uh, College, have some other fun things planned. So uh, plan for that. The 50th exhibition is still up, so if you have a chance to come visit us, we've had a lot of people come through for private tours, and this, the show has been a hell of a success, so I highly recommend it. And not as the uh, owner of the gallery, but someone who just loves art, it's an amazing experience to come see and explore, and also check out the vault. On display, we continue these uh, great exhibitions at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art of artist Steve Lynn and Latches of Voyagev, which will be up for a while still. So if you're in the area, go see. And, and John Miller at the Blue Paint Special at the, for, for, at the Flint Institute of Arts. So S Susan has been a longtime member of our Habitat family. And this is a picture of her with us at one of our sofa shows. And uh, we're grateful to have her. So Susan, come by and say hello. I'm gonna stop sharing. And uh, I'm gonna, oh, you forgot to unmute yourself. So let me try to get you unmuted. So I can get you just how say hello to everybody. There you go. Hello. <laughs> We're grateful to have you, Susan. So I'm going to get you to go ahead and try sharing your screen. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing your presentation talking about yourself. I know there's a picture of your mother, which is an important part of your career in life. So once you get the PowerPoint up and running, you can share the screen and we'll hopefully have a full screen view and we'll go from there. Um, yep. Yeah, really fun. So I've started putting a slideshow together of available work, but I know Susan has a, a better presentation with the entire, can, entire legacy. Can you, can you see the title page? Not yet. You have to share your screen. So far okay. you've enabled the PowerPoint, but click that green button and click the screen we did before and hopefully we'll be up and running in no time. I'm looking for my share option. It should be on. If you can see my face, you should be able to see the share option. If you can't see my face, then you can't see the share option. Susan and I have gone over this a couple of times, so just give her a minute, please, till we can figure this out, make sure it runs smoothly. Do you have the uh, presentation up, Susan? Yeah, I've got the um, PowerPoint up. Okay. Oh, so, there it is. It was covering up the share screen. Yep. So click share screen, click the screen you want to share, and press the share button. Should be on our way. And so you have the, you're on the wrong screen. So you have to select the other screen. Try it again, share, and click the other one. Now we're going to get it. Sending on a couple of invitations. And okay, so now we're on the right screen, but we don't see the presentation. So click the presentation button. There you go. Perfect. All right. We're in business. We're in business. Well, thank you for being here, Susan. And monkey business. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Aaron and Habitat, for inviting me to share my work with everybody. And uh, thanks for everybody like spending a bit of their Saturday with us. Um, I wanted to talk 
about my metamorphosis from seamstress to glass sculptor. And uh, the story starts with my mother. So I thought I would um, start with the story that I wrote with her. Um, let's see. My mother is a complicated woman. She, like most parents, prayed and hoped her children would have more, do better than she had the opportunity to accomplish in her own lifetime. At the same time, however, she brought with her the limitations and biases and tragedies of her own upbringing. She, um, she smoked and she drank a little bit. Um, she had issues about men and sex. She would drop us off at church every Sunday with a quarter. And then every night we would say our prayers at night. I helped her build a rock garden. We collected rocks from everywhere. She was independent. She liked to wear a floor length leopard print muumu. <laughs> she worked hard and out of necessity or boredom or martyrdom, she did everything herself. Aspirations for her children were limited. She encouraged me to learn to type and hoped I would finish high school. Oh, and find a nice man. She taught me to sew. She borrowed money from my Aunt Mary to help me complete college. And she was so proud when I graduated, even though it was a degree in art. She worried how I would make a living and was so ha happy when I met my husband, Brian. Like her, I'm independent. I started a sewing business. I planted a garden. I work hard. I like to wear leopard print <laughs> and I collect rocks from everywhere. This is my dad and he had a little video play, but it was super glitchy, so we're just going to pass over that. Um, so both my parents had previous families by the time I appeared on the scene. Um, at this time, my dad was 62 and my mom was 39. Um, so their previous families were grown and had children of their own. I'd been a surprise baby, but my younger brother was a shock. We lived in a lower middle class neighborhood in Duluth, Minnesota, you know, eh? <laughs> my mother taught me how to cook and sew and clean, you know, as moms do. And she urged me to learn to type so I have something to fall back on. She said things like do it right or don't do it at all. Act like a lady. And at age eight, that all seemed like a very reasonable plan and uh, very reasonable advice. But when I hit my teens and realized there might be more for me, well, let's just say I was a little restless. And my mother would have described that period of time a little differently. <laughs> at age 16, I went to England with my two best friends, both 17. Um, one girlfriend had an aunt in London, so the pitch to our parents was that we would stay with her aunt, but as soon as we got over there, we just went, ran amok. Um, we hitchhiked all over England, and um, we did connect with the aunt eventually, but um, so we were there for a month, just hanging out. Um, we pitched a tent on a horse farm and stayed there for a week. And one night we even stayed at Stonehenge. This is before Stonehenge was all fenced off. Mm. So I left home for Iowa, eventually where my half sister lived. I think I was 16 at the time. And I worked as a waitress for a couple of years and saved up enough money to put a down payment on a little house or to start college. And fortunately for my future, I was dating a boy who spent a lot of time 
arguing the reasons that I shouldn't go to college. And um, I was also tired of being a waitress. So the planets were aligned and I attended the University of Iowa. I moved to Iowa City and studied fine art and graphic design at just the time when computers were being kind of um, introduced into, into that field. Um, so the minute I graduated, my degree was worthless. <laughs> but I'd met a new boy named Brian and he encouraged me to open up my own It was called I'm Pins and Needles. And look, I'm using my graphic design talents I learned in college. Um, but after 12 years in two locations and a staff of eight employees, I grew tired of sewing and I missed making art. So I sold my shop and um, concentrated on creating mixed media sculptures construction. And at that time they were constructed of wood and stained glass. So this is one of the, the assemblages in the way back days. And it's titled in Italy, they do things differently. And I did shows across the US, but I found that pretty exhausting and for the most part, unrewarding. I realized I was going to have to give up, I was going to have to up my game if I was going to evolve and um, advance beyond doing shows. And um, I decided to focus on glass. And I researched other glass artists and was immediately attracted to work with a strong narrative style. I examined how glass was photographed for magazines and who the best galleries were. It was about that time that um, Farron Gallery had a call for artists in connection with Celestial Seasonings for a teacup show that um, was an annual show at that time. And they were accepting concept drawings. So I sketched a sewn glass teacup entitled it Sleepy Time Quilted Teacup Cozy. And I was excited about the, the concept about doing it. And, um, and what I didn't like about stained glass was the heavy lead lines. So I thought this would be a remedy um, to get rid of the heavy lead lines in glass. Um, so I sent them this concept and, you know, I, and it looked exactly like that. <laughs> this is, this is a photograph of the concept that I sent them. And the likelihood of them accepting it was slim. So I, I wasn't too worried <laughs> about actually having to figure out how to sew glass, but it was accepted. And then I had eight months to figure out the technique. Here's the end result. Um, at this time, my, my um, kiln was the size of a toaster cozy. So this is an actual sized teacup and each one of those uh, components, each one of those sections had to be fired individually because my kiln was so tiny. Um, and I honestly think that had I not sent, had I not been accepted to the competition, I don't know if I would have persevered to figure out <laughs> how to actually sew glass. But um, there, so there was plenty of meltdowns and breakage and, you know, but nothing gets something done like a deadline and a little panic. So eventually I worked out the technique. And here is another early piece. It's a um, perfume and it has a sewn glass jacket around a, um, a vessel. So, um, ended up returning to what was familiar, um, referencing sewing glass dress forms for inspiration and created um, small sculptures. I was still working with my tiny kiln. So again, each one of these components had to be fired 
individually in the kiln. And um, this is my first functional handbag. Love the handle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I learned a lot from, of course, this piece. Um, and one of the things that I learned is that the handle had to be integrated in with the handbag because these handles are um, loose and it was quite an effort to keep them from just flopping over and breaking mm -hmm. the handbag. Right. So the, the design that I'm working with now where the handbag is integrated into the designing and rigid you know, ends up to be kind of an important feature. <laughs> yeah. This is a, another crossbody bag. And I made this one when I was doing my residency at Pilchuck because um, I wanted something to carry to the auction. So um, I did patchwork samplers to explore um, color and composition and um, also to re resolve some engineering challenges. Um, one of the challenges with this piece is it's on a metal uh, stand. And um, boy, it took a long time to find somebody who would make a metal stand for me. Brian now does those for me. Um, he's gotten very good at welding. But at the time, um, yeah, it was, I think I ended up going to an automotive welder or something. It was, it was a challenge. Um, so while doing shows, I heard about these places called Pilchuck and Wheaton Arts and, and that they offered residencies. And um, up to this point, I, I was self-taught in everything that I had um, explored with glass. The opportunity to work in a real studio sounded super exciting. So in 2001, I innocently applied to both programs. Um, for the three months at Pilchuck and then a two month fellowship at Wheaton. And in retrospect, I was 100% underqualified to apply. Um, luckily, I had no idea. Um, but I was accepted into both. And I learned later it was because, um, because I was self taught, my, my approach was so um, different than the other applicants. So. That turned out to be a good thing. Um, so I was accepted into both residencies that year and um, it was really a pivotal point to work in a professional environment, top-notch facilities with you know just stellar equipment. Um, and I was introduced to other young artists who were academically taught and you know I didn't even know that you could go to school for glass. And uh, the bonus also was uh, Bill Morris and his team were using the hot shop at the time. So, you know, I'd grab a cup of coffee and go to the hot shop and, and enjoy the show. And I was really witnessing what it was like to be a professional artist. My husband, Brian, joined me for a few days um, during my residency out at Check. And it must have made an impression on him too, because he returned home and converted um, an old house that we had next to our home into my studio while I was gone. So um, my previous studio had been in front of the house and it was that tiny kiln and a the work table. And I came home and he had moved my tiny kiln and my work table over to this big house. <laughs> and um, it was, it was really a, fabulous gift to have my own studio. Our original plan, because the house was not in very good shape, is we were going to tear it down. Um, so instead, it ended up to be my studio. This is my second studio. So as a child, As a child, I spent hours 
pouring over the Montgomery Wards catalog, putting gold stars on things I liked. I don't know if, if any of you did the same thing. The Sears catalog would come and you, you'd go through the whole thing and dog ear all of the important stuff. This is this is way before Aaron's time. Uh, um, so as an adult, it was comforting to return to those familiar images. Um, and it led me to exam, examine customary domestic expectations and traditional roles. I learned Photoshop and I Frankenstein my favorite ladies together. So in this piece, In this piece, her dress is this lady's dress here in the lower right. So I would take dresses and faces and arms and kind of, like I said, stitch them all together in Photoshop. And uh, the images are, are um, photoshopped and then a transparency is made and then um, the images are actually sandblasted into the glass. So referencing my, my past gave voice to my work and um, it provided my own quirky interpretation of my childhood memories. I borrowed familiar nostalgic objects to reinforce a narrative and offer a related but skewed interpretation. In reference, 1950s ads of women created a visual and emotional dialogue between my work and the viewer. Intimate clothing becomes even more binding and dangerous when it's out of glass. The sandblasted lace on this corset is made up of housewives cleaning and ironing. You kind of see the ladies hard at work. That's great. It's a, it's a crazy, impressive piece. I've always been fascinated with traditional feminine crafts and how women used objects in the home as canvases for creativity. Here is my interpretation of a toaster cozy. Cake is a celebratory offering, a labor of love expressing happiness. Title of this work is Five Happy Housewives. This piece is titled, The Five Second Rule. <laughs> I've heard of eight, eight second rules, five second rule, uh, get to it quick. Yeah. <laughs> What's the eight second rule? If it falls on the ground, you got eight seconds to pick it up and eat it. <laughs> no, no, it's five seconds. <laughs> is it five? Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> You've given yourself three extra seconds. Yeah, I guess every... Generation adds an extra second, right? <laughs> Although my mother tried her best, I never really took to baking. Ironically, I would always burn myself and get mad and things doesn't taste good. And <laughs> so, so I am not a good cook at all. 
but I was happy to spend weeks finding a way to frost a glass cake. I started my series of cake, glass cake slices to commemorate the happy moments in my life. I remember these. That's me as a little girl. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a bakery window I did for a gallery here in Columbia. Kind of super cute. This 1950s cookie jar was just asking for an artistic interpretation. <laughs> and that's my husband's hand. I photographed his hand picking up a cookie. Hmm. This leaded teacup was an interpretation for a series of women popping out of cups. Oh, yeah, that's a flip side. <laughs> I like the subtleties of the lipstick on the napkin. Thank you. When I find an image I like, I will often place her on several works. This is Sleeping Beauty's Castle that I kept in my own collection because the S and the B can also be Susan and Brian. I put her on a cake slice. And here she is on a, in a sculpture titled Sleepy Me. My fascination with fairy tales did not diminish as I got older. <laughs> Instead, I'm intrigued with the overlapping of domestic expectation and fantasy. Inspired by Cinderella Slipper, this piece is titled Restless Night. And the um, feathers surrounding the pillow are pot de verre. Hmm. I saw on one of these in turquoise at one time, I think. Possibly. <laughs> I think it had flowers on the inside. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. In the same series, this life-size gown is titled What Fairy Tales Are Made Of. The silk lining of the skirt has a 1950s kitchen printed on it. And the skirt is made of a thousand pots of bear scissors that from a distance look soft and feathery, but are actually <laughs> super sharp and uh, a little dangerous. We had trouble, I had my assistant and I stitched the scissors onto the gown and, and the problem we were having is that the thread that we were using was getting um, cut by the scissors because they were so sharp. Um, so I ended up using something called a jeweler's uh, rat tail, which is just like the opposite. We were having trouble cutting it with our scissors. We ended up having to burn it off hmm. and we knotted it constant not one thing it's another mm -hmm. let's see where am i so returning from full circle from my seamstress days my work has tra transitioned toward life-size clothing and a royal crown is inspiration for bedazzled braziers and pillows they look very crown-like to me. Standing chandeliers became chandelier dresses. This is for Laura Donifer's um, glass fashion coin, I believe. Although the engineering is different with glass, my sewing experience and understanding of the structure of clothing eased my transition between 
fabric and glass. I feel I'm very familiar with taking flat sheets of material and giving them form. Unyielding and yet compelling, I create garments for the brave of heart and possibly the well-insured. Yes, it is. Here's our Laura Beth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was again at the Toledo Glass Fashion Show. Cover of the book, great. Yeah, awesome. Another topic that was intriguing to me as a child was the story of Adam and Eve. And I always thought that the treatment of Eve was terribly unfair. Being made from Adam's rib and being blamed for so much <laughs> in the Garden of Eden. I created works exploring the image of Eve and the subjective nature, nature of the apple, using the apple as a visual metaphor for womb and procreation. And in this piece, the lace is made up of little eaves. Hmm. Did you do you make the lace from scratch or modify something? Um, it's done in Photoshop. Oh, it's so, okay. Um, I scanned in just like a like a standard lace, and then found images of. Eve or housewives and then shrunk them down, you know, and simplified them to a silhouette and then placed them on the, the image of the lace. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, just a lot of monkey. So this is a detail of Eve's penance. So as an artist, I have the luxury of exploring the complexities of domestic life from the safe distance of my studio. My misguided domestic talents embrace the concept of sewing in an unexpected medium, baking an ed inedible cake and stitching dangerously unyielding clothing. I want to share a couple projects I'm particularly proud of. One is being selected in 2008 to be featured on the 14th floor of the Hotel Murano in Tacoma. And um, this is the display scene when the elevator opens up on the 14th floor. And uh, guests are greeted with one of my corsets and this 20 foot glass display. Wow. Awesome. I know, super cool. Mm -hmm. We did a good job. We did a real good job. Yeah. yeah. And all the floors are beautiful, man. Mm. Let's see. Oh, so <laughs> I kind of forgot about this, but one of the things um, when I agreed to, to be the artist on the 14th floor is I had to supply... 15, 20 photographs that could be blown up and um, installed on the walls on the 14th floor. And um, it was just when digital cameras were becoming pretty common, um, but I had to upgrade and I, gosh, I spent like, I don't know, $2,000 upgrading to, um, what was it, a 15 megapixel <laughs> camera just so I could get um, decent enough resolution. So um, this is one of the photographs. I felt like rather than show my technique, because since I'm a, a kiln artist, that's just like watching paint dry, um, I would share with the viewers um, some more of my work and kind of have my studio in the background. So this is one of my patchwork dress forms. And um, here are twigs coming out of the kiln cast for uh, the communal nest. And there's the communal nest. It's a big one. So 
Yeah, I created this in, in, at the Pittsburgh Glass Center during a residency in 2008. And um, I had started in advance in my studio, like six months in advance, because there are about 500 glass twigs. Um, most of them cast in my kiln, and then um, some were pulled from the furnace at the PGC. Um, so my two month residency ended with a, um, a show in our gallery downstairs and the communal, this is the communal nest in their gallery space. But while I was in, in Pittsburgh, I worked with a group of women from the Bethlehem Women's Shelter and um, they were invited to the PGC to make twigs um, to add to the communal nest. All of the twigs in the center were sent by other artists. Um, so I got maybe 50 twigs and sent from all over, from as far as Australia, people were sending twigs to be added to the nest, which was awesome. Um, so the women from the Bethlehem Women's Shelter came to the PGC and we made twigs. And um, I had never been exposed to big city domestic violence like that before. And I mean, these women were just amazing, but had battle scars. Oh my gosh, I felt it, it was just like a whole nother set of emotions um, witnessing uh, just through these women's physical presence, what they had gone through. Um, so I got back to my studio and thought about, you know, just the troubled circumstances that had distorted their lives. And um, returning to my studio, I began a new series um, incorporating domestic objects as I'd always done, but now as metaphors. That's a detail of the chair in the center. So I took, I combined um, domestic objects, things commonly used in the household, and I made one as beautiful as I could make it, and the other one as distorted and, and um, broken. This piece is titled Sweetness Remains. Trying to remember what the titles of these are, sorry. Um, let's see. This one is titled Can't Let Go. And the pieces are uh, bound together with glass chain, spilled milk, no chance of a clean escape. Living in the shadow. It's always with me. And clumsy me. So in closing, for years I believed my work was about myself, but ultimately it's about my mother and the messages she firmly embedded and I'm able to indulge my own notions of domestic role playing. My work embraces the feminine ideals of sensuality in a seductive but unforgiving material, offering conflicting messages of comfort and expectation. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, so much for taking us into your life. It's great <laughs> to see these powerful works. And it's great to give them context because I've seen so many of them but neglected to ask, you know, the real depth behind him. And it was very moving as, as Mary just pointed out in the text. Um, Tim had a question about the piece that was the very first uh, dress you made with the scissors. Where is that piece now? Is it somewhere? Do you remember? Yes, I, um, I installed it um, in a collector's home in Dallas, Texas. I think since, since then she has moved, um, but, Yes, it, it got placed 
in a in a nice collection. Thank you so much for letting us know. So I'm going to take over the screen real quick, give you a couple glimpses into the unique uh, purses that uh, Susan has made. And you may have seen these at different shows. She's always brought a couple for exhibitions. They're fully functional purses. My late grandmother owned one. It was a lot of fun seeing people walk around with these, these objects. And, you know, they might have Kleenex in them, <laughs> maybe something else delicate, or a phone, credit card, who knows. But they are great. And we just, we had a, a client locally who bought two of them. And during our uh, weekend, we had two of Cinderella's handbag, which are going to be launching today, which is now up on our website, uh, habitat.com forward slash limited. So maybe you can give us a little inspiration about um, the handbag before we show it, uh, Susan. Sure. Well, um, the first handbag that I made, I made for the Pilchuck auction to carry to the auction, kind of as a little business, my own little business card. Um, but they were so fun to do. They're really a nice size. Um, I love building things. So it has just enough engineering challenge. You know, I spoke about realizing that the, the handle really had to be incorporated into the design so that it didn't do damage to the handbag. And um, and my, my goal is eventually to build one big enough that I can actually get a postcard in my phone into, but, <laughs> but they get too heavy. So um, until then, yes, it'll be a tissue and maybe a lipstick. <laughs> right. They are very fashionable. They're very fun. And uh, the clients I have locally put three of them in their powder room and dedicated their whole entire powder room to Susan with different works of hers, All which right. is fantastic. All, to, which everybody, should, right. everybody should do, right? Right. So here's a glimpse at the handbag. They, it's different than the others uh, being a more rounded form. And it's just simple and simple style and color. It's very beautiful. And you can see it opens up and has a magnet. So these are online. Let me see if I have any more slides. If I do not, let me stop this PowerPoint and get it out of the way. So you can kind of see them on the Habitat website available now. We sold two of them, so there are eight left. But we are honored to have you, let me stop sharing. Join us today, Susan, and give us a glimpse into your career, life, and world. And I'm looking forward to putting together some more ideas with you in the near future because I love your stuff. Um, they're very moving in all kinds of ways and just overall beautiful. And uh, I, I know someday we'll get a corset for me who will look fantastic. I can't, I can't <laughs> Well, if anybody... Measurements. It's a measurement. It's no problem. I'll make sure to send you my wife, you know, pretend it's me. <laughs> She'll, she'll be she'll love it but thank you again for being here and if you have any questions anybody this would be the time to ask them um, i'm going to zip up through this most people most people just gave you praise and they really enjoyed hearing your stories and about you and your work and and as soon as we have a chance to get back together it's always great seeing you at the gallery and hopefully we'll see you soon and our events we've planned for uh end of january down in florida for the west coast weekend so uh let me see if anybody else anything but thank you these are, <laughs> these are, and, and it made, these, someone just commented, I'm a, I'm a fine women's accessory salesman. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, great. Well, thank you all for joining me today. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday and I'm able uh, to reach anytime. Thanks, Tim, too. Susan, thank you so much for being here. I've known you for so long and seeing your history all in one place and said a little bit of time has been lovely. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Susan. You. That thanks, was Susan. terrific. Love your work. Really? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. You guys are most welcome. All right, we'll see everybody soon. This will be shared up on YouTube too. So for the people that missed it, make sure to send them a message because it's a great thing to experience. See you all next week. Have a great one. Bye-bye. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Thank you, Tim. Bye. <laughs>